Alors moi, je vous dis à aujourd'hui, moi, je prends parti. Si demain, le business passe de un sportif, le football n'existera plus. Je pense que la mídia est importante, très importante. Pour moi, c'était très important, parce que si ce n'était pas la mídia, peut-être que je ne pouvais pas connaître. El flaco Cruz dijo, si tú cuando eres pequeño juegas muy bien al fútbol, vas a ser jugador de primera división. Si además de jugarlo muy bien lo entiendes al juego, podrás llegar a ser internacional. Si tú lo juegas muy mal, serás un jugador de segunda línea. Y si no sabes jugar nada al fútbol, seguramente serás periodista. <risa> É muito frustrante você ouvir um europeu narrar um gol. Entendeu? O, o momento culminante de um gol. Eu acho que, que isso reflete exatamente o grito da multidão. Porque a multidão não grita gol. A multidão não grita gol. No fundo, é porque o gol não precisa acabar nunca. Colômbia campeão da América. Colômbia campeão continental. Colômbia campeão continental. Mi patria, mi patria querida, Colombia, y se escribe con letras de oro el nombre de Colombia en el concierto mundial del fútbol. Brasil versus France, the 1998 World Cup final. For Aimé Jacquet, the French coach, the satisfaction of winning the World Cup was obvious, but he immediately resigned. He was in no mood to play ball with the press, who had constantly made personal attacks on him. Aujourd'hui, vous n'avez pas envie de pardonner? Non, je pardonnerai jamais. Jamais, je pardonnerai. Très bien, Aimé. France has the longest running sports daily in the world, La Keep. It began in 1903 and is possibly France's strongest voice. C'est vrai, tout à fait logique que la critique doit être présente. Et je dirais même qu'elle est elle est indispensable parce que la critique permet la progression. Où je suis pas du tout d'accord. C'est que elle attaque l'homme. Jacquet had endured a cascade of criticism in the lead up to the World Cup, particularly from the Paris-based press who portrayed the coach, the son of rural butchers, as an unskilled country bumpkin. Lorsque les médias français n'ont pas pu attaquer le professionnel que j'étais, ils ont attaqué l'homme. The success of players can often depend on how popular they are with the press. Newspapers can influence their appeal to the public. Well, I certainly was the first one who got into the commercial side of it. Because footballers had never been used, yet they just kicked the ball around. I started selling everything. You know, from aftershave to <laughs> eggs to oranges, clothes chewing gum, you name it, and I was advertising it. I was earning more off the pitch than I was on it. You know, I was a swing in 60s, and I was part of it. Best came under increasing pressure as a star, having been, some say, overexposed to cameras off the pitch. Coupled with an escalating drink problem, his footballing career faltered. Best was the source of much speculation amongst the British media. And you get a phone call from someone telling you that uh, uh, your son's dead. Uh, it's not it's not very nice for my dad. Uh, but that just that about sums him up for me. You know, they, you think they'd check before they actually put it out uh, or call anyone. It's not too difficult to get hold of me and ask me if I'm dead or not. 
they can make anything up and say anything they want about anybody. They did it more to me than anybody because uh, I'm an easy fodder for them, I suppose, and they still do it. And they still follow me around. Since I stopped drinking, they follow me hoping I'm going to fall down and get a photograph of me being picked up out of the gutter, but they'll have a long wait. One football star that did end up in the gutter was the legendary Brazilian, Garincha. He was a hero, national brasileiro, né? E o fim da vida dele foi um fim da vida muito doloroso, muito doloroso. Ele estava muito mal aqui no subúrbio do Rio de Janeiro. Ele estava uh, quase que abandonado, né? E, e um dia um jornalista viu ele deitado na sarjeta, na rua, às 9 horas da manhã, e me telefonou, falando que o Garrincha estava muito mal. Many still consider Garrincha as the best footballer in South American history. That may seem surprising when lined up beside other, more publicized names. Agora, o Garrincha, ele desbaratava todo e qualquer sistema tático. O Didi dizia assim, se a gente tiver algum aperto, joga a bola lá para o Mané, como ele era chamado, que ele resolve o problema. E ele resolvia. Ele resolvia. Eu digo com toda sinceridade, ele só não é tão popular mundialmente como o Pelé, porque a mídia não trabalhou o Garrincha como trabalhou o Pelé. Eu nunca tive problema, graças a Deus eu nunca tive problema. Porque eu acho que é importante, que é o que leva né, a mensagem ao, ao povo. Então, esse, esse tratamento, esse cuidado que os atletas, os artistas, as pessoas importantes têm que ter, é, é saber desse respeito. Né? Pelé, um undisputed genius on the field, has shown as much acumen off it. The media was, and is, happy to promote Pelé, unlike the unfortunate Garincha. If Pelé's a brand that the media are happy to stand on a pedestal, there is one player they are happy to knock off it. And Diego Maradona loves them too. Maradona has always reacted against the media in a volatile way. When press surrounded his home, he turned a hose on them. Not satisfied with giving the media a drenching, Diego then put them under fire. Maradona's weapon, an air gun. Very mal, very mal. I don't have been friends of anyone. I've never asked for a note, I've never asked for a note. But because I think that if we didn't exist as players of football, we wouldn't exist as the narrators, barbaros who win a fortune. The European media condemned his drug taking. But in South America, the press not only forgave the fallen star, they also made excuses for him. Despacito por las piedras, porque el que está dopado, el que está drogado, es el negocio del fútbol. Y cuando se obliga a un jugador a jugar, Cada dos días, cada tres días, se le está imponiendo un ritmo que ni los caballos de carrera pueden soportar. The media has always placed Diego center stage, and he has always shown he is more than capable of performing on it. El, el grave problema de Maradona ha sido que él no puede reaccionar porque no puede sentirse como un ex jugador de fútbol uh, a veces me pongo a pesar que sería por ejemplo de un concertista de piano si a los 35 años le dicen tú no puedes tocar nunca más el piano puedes tocar el piano pero solo nunca más vas a subir a un escenario a un teatro creo que es duro the flawed football genius provides an endless source of stories and is condemned as a role model O sea que la droga, la droga existe en todas partes del mundo y nosotros le estamos haciendo una propaganda barba. Porque yo soy, por ahí, el mal ejemplo para que los chicos lo tomen. 
Pero yo no quiero ser ejemplo de nadie. Por reflejo, por ahí lo soy. No, porque mi hijo, porque, Maradona, porque él sigue el ejemplo de Maradona. Cállate la boca, estúpido. Peor para vos si sigue el ejemplo de Maradona. Si no lo sabes educar vos, Maradona no tiene la culpa. Maradona was once worshipped in Italy. But newspapers need stories. Italy's main sports newspaper, Gazzetta dello Sport, first appeared in 1896. By the late 20th century, there were hundreds of publications devoted to football from all over the world. More media, more competition for readers, more column inches to be filled. Acontece que a vida privada é, chega a entrar muitas vezes, né? As pessoas querem saber da vida privada da, do, do jogador, da, da personalidade. E no caso do jogador de futebol, né? Ele tem que aparecer jogando futebol. Infelizmente nesse tempo eu estou contundido, machucado, né? Então as pessoas né, se interessaram mais na minha vida pessoal mesmo porque eu estou fora do, do, dos gramados. Es gab schon äh, einige Geschichten, die in Deutschland die frei erfunden waren und die, die einem sehr weh getan haben. Und es war nicht einfach, da damit umzugehen. Vor allem, weil natürlich die Familie irgendwo in Mitleidenschaft gezogen wird. Und äh, ich habe auch Prozesse geführt gegen, gegen Boulevardpresse. Und äh, das war natürlich dann so, dass ja, jeder Schritt gegen die es noch verschlimmert hat. Und deswegen bin ich eigentlich heute froh, dass ich, dass ich absolut im Hintergrund leben kann. You won't be able to stop headline makers, because that's what the media is about. The papers today are beat, you know, they're knackered now, with instant news and television, internet, all that. So they have to create a, a sensationalism in the news and their journalism. And it's absolute nonsense, it really is. I mean, you just cannot believe what you see reading the newspapers today. Scotland's Glasgow Evening News published the first ever sports paper in 1878. The rapid development of competitive football gave rise to increasing rivalry among Scottish print journalists. From 1911, these are the first images of journalists captured on film. The media was to become an important part of keeping the game in the public eye. Even in the early days, great efforts were made to submit the latest scores first. I'm probably the last personal contact between a laptop and pigeons. Because when I was a very young reporter, I worked with a very old reporter, a man called Sandy Adamson, who in his youth had covered three Open Championships and two Scottish Cup finals using pigeons. And the stories about the pigeons are legion. The, the classic story is that you go along to the match with your assistant, who is the assistant pigeon controller, and you write your piece and you handed it to him and it was put into the little cylinder and attached to the leg and then thrown up into the air, followed by a strangled shout of, hearts have equalized. As moving pictures developed in the late 19th century, entrepreneurs were quick to spot a money-making opportunity. Moving pictures really start not, not on a screen as, as uh, we would expect, but as in effectively pay-per-view. Uh, they were first shown in 1894 in a, a, a box-like contraption called a kinetoscope. You put a coin in and you'd see about uh, one minute of usually a boxing round. The earliest football footage that survives from late in 1897 was taken by a French company called Lumiere. It was filmed in London. We don't know who the team was, possibly it's Woolwich Arsenal. You're watching very much a staged event. For, for the curiosity of audiences, who probably knew nothing about football at all. It's just a strange thing that the English did. 
In the early 1900s, two Englishmen, Mitchell and Kenyon, turned film to commercial ends. They filmed workers leaving the docks and factories of northern England and at local football matches. Mitchell and Kenyon were more interested in filming the crowds than the games, although some match action was filmed. This is Newcastle against Liverpool in 1905. The reason more crowd shots were filmed was that after the games, the public would pay to enter screening auditoriums at local fairs in the hope of seeing themselves on the film. It's worth knowing that uh, films weren't shown in cinemas, as we, we understand, until about 1908, 1909. Uh, before then, films were shown in variety theatres, converted shops, all, all sorts of venues, and particularly fairgrounds. And these fairgrounds, were, the fairs that would tour the country, had what were called bioscopes. These were giant auditoria, who would hold a thousand people or more where a lot of people saw their, their, their first film, and where the sort of the idea of, of cinema really developed in, 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 in Britain and, and across Europe. Film of the Cup Final was a popular early attraction for these new cinemas. The 1912 final between Barnsley and West Bromwich was filmed in great detail. At the start, the relationship between football and film was one of mutual benefit. Football gained nationwide exposure, the cinemas were guaranteed packed houses. But soon, football began to realize the extent of its worth. The selling of the rights to the games was to become a big issue. In the 1920s, though, the newsreels take over. They've discovered their form and they've become part of every cinema programme. You've got people going in their millions to the cinema. The first FA Cup final at Wembley in 1923 attracted huge media interest. The Football Association had sold exclusive rights to one of the newsreel companies for £1,000. That left the others to disguise cameras in any way they could to get in. Secretly shot footage such as this was common. The 36 was notorious because Wembley Stadium demanded £2,000 for the rights and the newsreels for once acted in, the, in accord and refused to pay that money. But it's no good trying to get inside. Stop that man, he's got a camera. <laughs> Thanks for trying, Sydney. So the newsreels determined that though they weren't allowed in the ground, uh, Wembley had no jurisdiction over the air. Um, so they all hired aeroplanes and autogyros and, and filmed the game from the air. Ridiculous coverage. Both goals were in peril in the early stages of the game. Arsenal attacking through Bastin, James and Hume. You can easily pick out James, he's the tall one in shorts. The 1928 Amsterdam Olympics were well covered by Europe's print media. This was the first football tournament filmed in detail. Every match was covered, often with more than one camera. The film of the 1928 Olympic Games, the Lippe Spieler, was essentially made by the world's first sports film expert, a German called Wilhelm Prager, who had made a, a, a gymnastics film in Germany of, uh, of a high reputation. And so it was the first time that they were trying to create something with, with a, a semblance of art. Um, which sort of reached its apotheosis with the 1936 Olympic Games film uh, made by Lenny Riefenstahl. None of the football games appeared in the official film of the games. The tournament was dominated by Argentina and the eventual winners, Uruguay. But the fans back home had little idea of what was going on. Media coverage took some days to get through. There was no public more passionate about football than the Italians. As filming a match meant that sometimes weeks would pass before edited pictures were ready for showing, 
the public was reliant on newspapers for information. Vittorio Pozzo, Italy's World Cup winning coach in 1934 and 1938, was by profession a football journalist. Era contemporaneamente giornalista e commissario unico. Quando nel 29 viene nominato commissario unico e resta giornalista, naturalmente nasce l'invidia di tanti altri colleghi giornalisti, i quali dicono, come primo, prima cosa, primo sospetto, favorirà il suo giornale. At the 1934 World Cup in Italy, 275 journalists representing newspapers from 29 countries were sent to cover the event. From the 1930s onwards, publications dedicated to football sprang up all over Europe. At the same time in Germany, Adolf Hitler was quick to recognize the importance of television as a propaganda tool. This Germany-Italy match from 1936 was the first televised game of football. The game was not, however, broadcast live. It was filmed, then replayed on television screens after being processed. The game was a draw. Italy also became the first country to televise its league back in the 1950s. The state television station Rai enjoyed a monopoly over football coverage protected by Italian law. This stranglehold would last until the 1980s. But a colourful sport, transmitted in black and white, had its problems for the viewer. Hoy día hay un aparatito de televisión y vos conoces a todos los equipos. Nosotros no le conocíamos ni el color de la camiseta a las elecciones nacionales de otros países. The vastness of South America meant that radio played an important part in football coverage. Games were often broadcast on radio long before being shown on television or newsreel. There was often a great disparity between what the listeners had heard and what they later saw. O rádio teve uma importância decisiva para a popularização do futebol. Porque o rádio ele tem sobre a televisão a capacidade de excitar a imaginação do povo. Então nós tivemos narradores e eles conseguiam transformar uma partida de futebol mal jogada Um extraordinário espetáculo artístico. Certain matches always seem more than just games of football. The first contest between Argentina and England was in 1951 in Buenos Aires. England lost and then claimed to have fielded a second stream side. Relationships between the countries have gone downhill ever since. Alf Ramsey's famous reference to the Argentines as animals after the 1966 World Cup was a comment made in the heat of the moment to a local radio station. The newspapers on both sides of the Atlantic were quick to pick up on it. In England, the Argentines were animals. In Argentina, the English were cheats. They questioned the bias of the referee towards the home side. Absolute nonsense. They were they were beaten and they were they beat themselves in a way. Nothing to do with referees. Ratting, uh, and he's a good pal of mine. I see him regularly, and I always say the same thing. You know, you, you're a silly lad. You know, you 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 can't argue with referees incessantly. They won't have it. Argentina's captain Ratting was sent off in the game. To the English media, a villain. To the Argentines, a hero. Ratin certainly bears no grudges. El inglés es un tipo muy especial. A mí me gustaría, yo si tendría medio, yo cada vez que voy a Europa, que cada año o dos años voy, me hago una carrera 
un rápido a, a Londres, me camino a Londres, ver esos micros de doble piso, ver la, la, la calle Oxford, ir a Piccadilly, todas esas cosas me gustan, ¿viste? me gusta mucho del inglés, yo soy un, un admirador del inglés. The global TV audience of 400 million for the 66 World Cup inspired the creation of a professional league in the USA. By the late 1970s, the North American Soccer League, the NASL, had attracted stars from all over the world. Teve, teve por exemplo, 10 anos, né, de, de, de 75 a 85, foi maravilhoso. Eu acho que o grande erro do do dirigente né, da liga uh, norte-americana na época, o grande erro foi não respeitar a televisão e a, e a imprensa, a mídia. In fact, the NASL did everything in its power to win over a dubious US media. Our games had to be stopped for 60 seconds for the insertion of, of commercials. The referee was fixed up with an earplug from uh, the TV guy on the sideline and um, would, at corner kicks or goal kicks or injured player or whatever, would make sure that uh, it took 60 seconds for, uh, for the game to restart. Despite these efforts, the NESL's television deal fell through after the first year. Soccer was not on the agenda of the American media. The Daily News needed someone to cover the Cosmos soccer team, which was the team of Pelé and Beckenbauer. And uh, I was sort of the newest person on the staff, the one with the least seniority, and they said, right, this is your assignment. You're going to be covering the soccer team. Um, to the rest of the world, covering a team that had both Pelé and Beckenbauer on it would be a dream assignment. And I quickly considered it a dream assignment. But to most American journalists, it was just that foreign sport that nobody wanted to be bothered with. Ruth is a contract called for $80,000 for two years. That's to be agreed to bond. Would you All right. sign it? Yes, sir, Colonel. The rapid expansion of print and radio networks in the 1920s had created a golden era of quintessential American idols, such as Babe Ruth. Soccer doesn't develop heroes. It's all about heroes. Baseball has its heroes. Football has its heroes. College football has its heroes. Well, I'm going out now and trying to make another one for you. Oh, there are already well-established hero-making mechanisms and heroin-making mechanisms in America now. There's more than enough. Soccer right now is a niche and will remain that way. Just as the NASL started to flounder, Argentina 78 was a media-fueled extravaganza. The global need for football at its highest level brought the spotlight on South America again. Color pictures were beamed around the world, carrying the images of FIFA's new sponsorship partners. The military government in Argentina spared no expense in building a new state-of-the-art satellite television center. Although in Argentina, all the televisions were still black and white. In 78, the Mundial contributed to the good that there was for the military militar, no es cierto? O sea, le ayudó políticamente. Pero le hubiera ayudado lo mismo si hubieran invertido 200 millones en lugar de 700. In Argentina, the Italians won the praise of their media, despite missing out on a place in the final to Holland. But at the 1982 World Cup in Spain, the pressure from the Italian media was so immense that the team decided to stop talking to them altogether. Trovamo a dover fare quell'ora di, di, di conferenza stampa con i giornali, a difenderci, a pensare cosa dire, a, a, a giustificare le prestazioni. 
Ora si è deciso, la squadra dice no, andiamo in campo, giochiamo, vediamo cosa siamo capaci di fare in campo e poi ci giudicherete di quello che facciamo in campo. If they failed, the press would be on them like a pack of wolves. Triumph and the pressure would be off. At least for the time being. Ci avrebbero sicuramente eh, distrutto la, la, da un punto di vista morale. Però abbiamo corso sto rischio. Non per questo, perché siamo stati poi, abbiamo vinto il mondiale. Per, però ci ha comunque consentito di vivere un periodo di un mese totalmente tranquilli, lontano da, da, dai riflettori e dalle luci della rivale. Earlier that year, Argentine-English relations hit an all-time low. Argentina's reclamation of Las Malvinas was seen as an invasion of British territory. England won the one-month war, although the Argentines were naturally belligerent in defeat. England's most popular tabloid newspaper, The Sun, followed the conflict with gung-ho enthusiasm. Four years later, the two countries met in the quarterfinals of the World Cup in Mexico. The media in England saw it as another battle, in Argentina as a chance to settle old scores. The media of communication eh, enfocaron el, el partido eh, como una especie de revancha de la guerra de las Malvinas. Y claro, se hace muy difícil sustraerse a ese ambiente tan generalizado, hacía que Inglaterra fuera algo más que un rival deportivo. En la cancha eso no se piensa, en absoluto. Cuando te hacen la pregunta a los periodistas, vos decís... Y si fue más que un partido, nosotros nos dimos cuenta. Los que dijeron que nosotros dijimos o pensamos o cometimos la guerra de las Malvinas con ese partido, yo no escuché a nadie en el vestuario, yo no, no lo hablé con nadie. Television played a new role in the 1986 World Cup. It dictated match kickoff times so as to reach the largest audience in the major markets. Some teams were forced to play in searing conditions. La televisión había puesto su, sus condiciones que se jugara eh, a las 12 al mediodía en la Ciudad de México, además eh, con una altitud de 2.500 metros y además con, un, con unos índices de smog muy pero muy alto. Aquello era inhumano. O sea, se vendía al mundo entero un mal producto futbolístico. Y yo entiendo que al juego hay que cuidarlo, eh, hay que defenderlo de, la, de las agresiones de la comercialización. Television came under scrutiny again. The Azteca Stadium, centerpiece of the 1986 World Cup, was owned by Televisa the media company that ran Mexican football. Era lo único que había. Y como era lo único que había, pues lo controlaba porque era el poder único que existía. Ahora ya no es solo Televisa, ahora ya hay otros poderes. Entonces hay competición. Guillermo Cañedo, who ran football for Televisa, was also a FIFA vice president. When Colombia withdrew from hosting the 1986 World Cup, the United States, Canada and Mexico made bids to take over. America's presentation was led by political heavyweight, Henry Kissinger. The run was pre-cooked. Uh, uh, I made uh, 
long presentation. We had really good backup. We had Beckenbauer with us, and I think Pelle even. Uh, and we made a thoughtful presentation. The Mexicans made, I forget whether they made any presentation. Havelange made no secret of his friendship with Cañedo or Televisa's owner, Emilio Escarriga. After the 1982 World Cup, he'd returned to Brazil in a private jet owned by Televisa. This led to speculation. Do you think Havelange says, listen, we're only going to vote for you to have the World Cup here if you fly me home in your private jet? No, there was a warm expression. I mean, Emilio Escarriga, whose plane it was, was a very, very nice man, very competent, really looked out for the well-being at that point of the president. As president in 1974, Havelange made the commercialization of FIFA a priority. Television was imperative to his plans. Je félicite les compagnies de télévision pour leur travail et autour de, du football dans tout le monde, par les contrats, par tout ce qui se fait direct et indirectement, il y a une somme qui, qui se produit et qui se déplace qui représente 250 milliards de dollars. Av vad som hände i i det här sammanhanget med att Mexiko två gånger i rad nästan fick fick världsmästerskapet och andra eh, engagemang. Det är företeelser som jag inte vill uttala mig om. So that is no comments. As club owner, media mogul, and politician, Silvio Berlusconi is the icon of the modern game. Berlusconi broke the domination of state broadcaster Rai by buying a network of regional television stations. In 1986, he acquired television rights too when he purchased Milan, one of the great clubs of world football. He then set about clearing the debris of mismanagement at the club left by his predecessors, whose corruption had seen Milan shamed and relegated. Berlusconi wanted a club to reflect his own image, that of success and excellence. The arrival of Berlusconi was fundamental because it took the Milan in situations not good and took it to a great level because he was a great entrepreneur, a great manager, a president very ambitious e ha dimostrato subito di essere di portare nel Milan grande, grande qualità, grandi giocatori, di riuscire a portare nel calcio anche delle idee nuove, perché voleva un calcio che divertiva la gente. Milan account for less than 1% of Berlusconi's media business turnover, but it is a useful platform, as owning both football and broadcasting businesses ensures public exposure. When he successfully ran for prime minister in 1994, he adopted the football slogan Forza Italia as his party's motto. In a country governed by a football club owner, this fervor is unlikely to wane. C'è un paese che ti segue, quindi giornalisti sportivi scrivono di calcio, ma poi ci sono anche giornalisti non sportivi che durante il mondiale eh, parlano di calcio, ci sono uomini politici, insomma, essendo un argomento eh, molto attuale, tutti parlano di quello. Berlusconi set an example for the rest of Europe to follow. In England, football was transformed by the arrival in 1992 of satellite television. Sky Television knew exactly what it needed to succeed. It was obvious to a blind rat that the top three sports in Britain are football, football and football. And therefore if we were going to be a valid broadcaster and Sky Sports was going to become successful and become an integral part of British society, that we had to have football. It was, it was simple as that. But the bidding process for the new Premier League television rights was far from simple. Tottenham Hotspur chairman, Alan Sugar, also owned the company that manufactured satellite dishes for Sky. He declared a conflict of interest, but was allowed to vote. As the chairman considered the bids, Sugar, who believed the deadline for bids had passed, made a call to Sky 
advising them that their rivals, ITV, had made a late, revised offer. Sky then outbid ITV by 30 million pounds. That happens in every sports right negotiation I've ever known of. It, 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 what's going on, phone calls and this, that, and the next thing. It's no different. But because in the past it hadn't happened because of the gentlemanly agreement between the BBC and ITV, for the press it was shock horror. What's going on here? It's a bit like a John le Carre novel, isn't it? More twists and turns. Well, duh, that happens all the time. Sky's timing couldn't have been better. The 1980s had been a grim decade for English football. The massive injection of finance revitalized the game. Clubs could now afford new stadia and a host of great foreign players. Sky Sports not only spent a fortune on rights, but also raised the standard of football coverage. You can't uh, deny the, the, the impact that Sky's television has made. When it first was muted and when it first came around, I was, well, everyone else was a real sceptic of, of it. I couldn't, I assume it says it's going to be absolute agony. But it's been surprisingly very good. With the deluge of TV money, players' fees also rocketed. In 1996, Alan Shearer moved to Newcastle for a world record £15 million. I think the whole game really has, has, has changed. The obvious change is, is the finance in, in, in football now. It's, it's, it's gone absolutely crazy. Nowadays, then, the, the money is, 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 is ridiculous, not only that players get paid but also um, transfer fees, they've, they've gone through the roof as well so the whole game has is, 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 is just gone completely bonkers if you like. Commentate perhaps. Absolutely. Be a cameraman. That'd be great. Men då ska samtliga vara representerade, då ska majoriteten ska man ta hänsyn till och inte ett litet fåtal. För nu har vi samma sak med de klubbarna, vi kan inte bara lyssna till G14. När det finns 6800 klubbar till som har en helt annan situation. Jag menar i Division 1 i England, de, de, de klubbarna där har ju inte mycket gemensamt med Real Madrid. Så det är, det, det är frågan om att se helheten och inte alltid bara tillfredsställa toppen. Och media, tidningar och television och så vidare, de koncentrerar ju all uppmärksamhet på den absoluta toppen. Det andra är inte intressant. And what of the fans? English Premier League ticket prices rose 300% in five years. Some claimed that the traditional fan base had been priced out of the game. I used to be able to buy a pint for about 80p down at my local. I used to buy a pork pie for 50p. My local cinema, it cost me about three quid a ticket. Every time ticket prices go up, you hear the wail coming from the bleeding hearts. Oh, God, what about the halt and lame? They can't afford it. Well, everything's going up. I'm sorry. You can't, you can't expect to have the best unless you're prepared to pay for it. As a business, Manchester United is in a league of its own. Global marketing grosses tens of millions a year. Their Old Trafford ground holds 70,000, but the club has 50 million fans worldwide. 20 million are Asian, hence United's regular pre-season tours to that continent. The club can earn vast sums in deals with a range of commercial partners, like Nike. The club also joined forces with the New York Yankees to exploit merchandising opportunities in America. In 1999, Sky's owner Rupert Murdoch tried to buy Manchester United and failed. Like Berlusconi, media moguls saw the value in controlling the product they had invested vast sums in. But the fans were wary of power being handed over by the football clubs, believing that team selection and management would be manipulated. Manchester United now has its own television station. 
the club aims to broadcast its home games on a global pay-per-view basis. With international rights worth over £60 million, it is a market that clubs are keen to get hold of. In 1992, the year Sky took over English football, Japan started a new professional league. The Japanese media made a refreshing change for many of the international stars brought in to help the J-League get off to a flying start. Tem grande cortesia, tem grande disciplina e procuram sempre falar sobre o, o espetáculo, né? Valorizar o espetáculo, né? As coisas boas que acontecem no jogo. Deixar de lado as coisas negativas. Ele fala, mas não dá ênfase. Aqui é o contrário aqui no Brasil. One of Japan's largest marketing companies oversaw the biggest campaign in Japanese history with the launch of the J League. Both the media and the fans wholeheartedly embraced the new creation. The year after the J League's launch, Merchandising sales reached over 3 billion yen. But by 1998, this had collapsed to just 324 million. J League was started as a toy shop, no, 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 あの、Japan and South Korea both spent $100 million on their bids to host the FIFA 2002 World Cup. Although fashions moved on in Japan, the first Mondial of the 21st century kept media interest in J-League alive. The rights to the 2002 and 2006 World Cups were bought for over $1.5 billion by German media giant Leo Kirsch. Broadcasters were asked to pay more than 10 times the rights fee charged for France 98. In Africa, there is no greater passion than football. But the staggering sums generated by the television revolution are yet to materialize here. The continent continues to supply Europe with some of the best players in the world, but without a steady stream of television revenue, local leagues remain undeveloped. Football, it, it is a brand. And to sell your brand, you have to organize it, prepare it, make it look nice. And then a bit of marketing, you sell it. That's where the Europeans have more money. And we in Africa, we don't have money. Simply because we are not organized. Africans believe their chances of hosting a World Cup are slim until they are seen to possess the facilities to host it, which include the means to beam television pictures around the world. <laughs> Generally, the massive influx of finance provided by the media has been beneficial to football. But with increased exposure, ratings are dropping. Le football, à l'heure actuelle, est en danger. Le football mondial, européen, est en danger. Il ne faut pas que le business l'emporte sur le sportif. C'est vrai que le football est business. OK, heureusement, puisqu'il il, il, il propulse et, et attire. Le, les sponsors, et qui sont les bienvenus, bien sûr, ça donne la possibilité d'avoir des, 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 des projets financiers énormes, mais il ne faut pas que le sportif soit battu. 
The media has been instrumental in making football the world's favourite sport. But should there be a limit to the media's power over the beautiful game? El fútbol profesional es muy feroz en sus exigencias. Aunque a veces pague mucho, es muy, pero muy feroz. Y a veces me hace recordar aquella frase de Winston Churchill cuando un periodista le preguntó cómo había llegado con tan buena salud a los 90 años de edad. Y, y don Winston Churchill contestó el deporte, el deporte, jamás lo practiqué. <risa>